Good evening. Thank you for coming to part two of the Design of Theory Fellowship lectures. I'm pleased tonight to introduce Benjamin Farnsworth. Um, ben came to SciArc overeducated, and we ruined him. Um, Ben's background is so impressive to be almost devastating. Um, a bachelor's in architecture, a bachelor's in, let me, in international history, a uh, law degree, right? You were solicitor of the Supreme Court of England, is that right? Of Wales. Well. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and then here at SciArc and doing the MR2 degree at, at SciArc. And um, we launched the Design of Theory Fellowship, and I think we, we knew what we wanted to do in the sense that we wanted to produce a uh, way of imagining or reimagining or revamping what theory would be for architecture. Um, in, in other words, I think that we had all sat and thought about the pro forma for training theorists is usually being one where the theorist is trained in an, in an MA or PhD program, and uh, not one in which uh, there's a kind of nurturing of the architect's mind as the architect. And um, so this is prompted in many ways by Eric Moss and Hernan de Alonso sitting down and saying, okay, well, so what are we gonna do? And uh, Todd and Marceline and Joe Day and myself, you know, um, uh, doing a lot of round table and, and thinking about that. And we came up with this design of a theory fellowship um, as a challenge to the pro forma of the specific training of, of architectural theorists and, and, and also by way, I think, architectural historians to a certain extent. And um, in, we, we launched it with a, a wing and a prayer, hoping that we would get some applications. We got uh, quite a few applications. And um, the application that Ben submitted to us stood out for me very immediately not just because he had spent a long time on fonts and sort of organizing the ontologies of information, which he did, he mapped a lot of this information, um, but through one line and he said, what can theory do for us? And it was enough of a kind of tagline, bumper sticker, what can theory, you know, like what can, what, I don't know what the ad is, that what, can, what can this do, what can, you know, Chrome do for you or whatever the case. And, um, but, uh, but that idea of the instrumentalizing of theory and that this would require a kind of fearlessness, that this would require a person who was willing to not correspond exactly to the uh, supposed rigors of what scholarship had been defined by the 19th century classical or the university model. And instead, this brave and audacious move to turn the, the, the terms into ones where the theory becomes not just operative, but something that is almost like a tool in the hands of the architect rather than the architect corresponding to a set of theoretical notions that exist in the world and hoping that those two align. And so Ben's application was like a slam dunk in my mind for what the design of theory fellowship should be and uh, should become. Um, ben was also brave enough to do this in the first year of its inception. And um, so I have referred to the design of theory, the uh, inaugural design of theory fellows as the victims of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a first run. And um, I asked Ben, I said, how do you want to be introduced? And as a true victim, he said, just introduce me as here's number two. So please welcome number two.
Thanks, Dora, um, for the introduction and for all your support and patience over, it's sort of a long year at this point because we're in the back end of October already. So, um, and thanks for all of you for coming on a, on a Friday afternoon. There is wine here which will act as some sort of uh, hook to keep you in your, your seats. Um, I want to also thank uh, people who aren't here tonight but who sort of made the fellowship possible. So the great and the good of Sayoc, Eric, uh, Hanan, um, Ming, um, and I also want to mention the cultural studies faculty, so Marcelin and Todd, and also Marcelo, who's been very supportive to me over the, the past year. Um, so this evening, as, as Dora alluded to, uh, constitutes the inaugural year SciArc Design of Theory Fellowship Lecture, part two. Um, I actually looked at Stefano's online, so I, he called himself part one, so I thought in the interest of continuity, um, it's a bit of a mouthful, and I think that part two part is the most uh, significant um, for me. Uh, I think my final thank you needs to go to Stefano, who, who says he's watching down in Cancun, but um, uh, I only half believe that. Um, Steph and I have been working, or existing, coexisting together for about seven years. We first met um, together at Peter Cook's office in London, um, and this was taken at Peter's Christmas party, I think in 2008 or 9. Um, uh, and in making preparations for the talk, I had cause to ponder on the nature of the partnership that Stefano and I have evolved um, over that time um, during the course of the, the fellowship year. It's a somewhat difficult partnership to characterize. Um, there have been moments uh, uh, that have been sort of akin to Tweedledum and Tweedledee, which is to say uh, a single brain in two bodies. Um, at other times, we functioned a little bit like Sark's very, very own push, push me, pull you, um, which is two brains in one body. Um, I actually looked up the push me, pull you when I, I thought of this reference and found out that one head does the talking and one does the eating, um, which also sort of resonated a little. Um, but I don't mind telling you that there have also been moments um, uh, where things have felt a little more akin to the weird spatialization of cognitive dissonance exemplified by the British pantomime horse. Um, if you don't know what a pantomime horse is, then you should, should Google it. Uh, you don't have pantomimes here, right? It's a, yeah, you do, you do. I thought it was a peculiarly British thing, that's just prejudice. Um, anyway, I'll leave it up to you uh, uh, to guess as to who was up front and who was down, down the rear end. Um, so just to highlight the, the, the divergent paths that Stefano and I have taken, um, uh, since September, um, uh, we've obviously both left SIARC, and, and uh, one of us, at least for this week, is, is sitting on a beach in Cancun uh, with his new wife. Um, uh, for me, however, um, my sort of daily existence is now the snow-carpeted campus of Syracuse University in uh, central New York. I'm told vociferously by the residents of Syracuse that you're not to call it upstate New York. That betrays a certain metropolitan prejudice that... Um, um, they don't favor. Um, I'm teaching at Syracuse and spending much of my time uh, attempting to convince the dean there, Michael Speaks, uh, uh, another sort of ex-Sciop person, um, to establish a winter program somewhere like Cancun, um, so we can all avoid the, uh, the ferocious winter for which Syracuse is famous. Um, I should also note that at Syracuse, I'm free to enjoy the lecture series, securing the knowledge that any discussion at the end may or may not include a question asked by myself or Stefano. I think of all the things we've had to do this year, that's been the most painful for us and for everybody else. Um, it turned the lecture series here at SIARC into a kind of weekly, I don't know, I felt like a death row uh, inmate that had his uh, sentence sort of commuted on a weekly basis, but it didn't stop the uh, cortisol from flowing. Um, my talk this evening, I want to briefly sketch out uh, the various lines of inquiry that have emerged to me as a result of both of my research and teaching during the course of the inaugural fellowship year. The SIARC fellowship as it ran for the last year was a, a part-time, a 50% time fellowship. It's changed this year. It will be full-time. And that meant I had time in the time when I wasn't officially a fellow to do quite a bit of teaching here and around LA. And I think that was really important in terms of uh, figuring out, as Dora said, what, what theory can do for us. Um, So I'm going to set out the rudiments of an argument, I hope, as to why we might want to think about the present as a conceptual ultima thule, which is a sort of last land, 
um, an architectural afterhood, if you will. And I also want to argue uh, that to do this is a good thing and to offer a few reasons why I find it productive. Skip forward too far. Um, I think this talk also offers a useful opportunity to reflect a little on the teaching, as I said, and to try and think about theory as it might result in certain types of pedagogical strategies rather than um, merely as a, a bunch of words or text to lie on some dusty shelf. Um, before jumping wholeheartedly into those issues, however, I do just want to offer a quick plug, as I think Stefano did, for OffRamp, which is SciArc's reborn online journal. Um, you can see the website here, and you can get access to it. Um, Steph and I worked pretty hard on issue number eight, which is to say the first digital issue, but we named it eight in um, uh, response to the fact there had been seven previous analog issues over the course of the 90s and 2000s. Um, with SciArc's new design of theory fellow, Benjamin Smith, Steph and I, and I are also editing and contributing to a forthcoming issue, which is to be called Lies. And it's to that issue that some of the arguments that I'll try and be advancing tonight will contribute. OK, those are the two issues. So the talk tonight is called Non-Non-Fiction. I think SIOP build it as non-fiction. They've probably had enough of double negatives, um, which would be reasonable. Um, and the subtitle is The Happy, Happily Ever After Life of the Architect Monk. Um, my talk today really concerns the state of the present. This present is, we might all agree, relatively complex. To be parochial for a second, um, it's not at all clear at present what the relationship is between architecture and architectural theory. Um, at least two contradictory states appear to exist all at once. Sometimes architecture is the beach ball bouncing across the dunes of theory. Uh, sometimes it appears to be the other way around, and the categories flicker and things are fuzzy. I'm having fun with the uh, GIFs or GIFs right now, so uh, there are a couple in the presentation. But somebody should do a studio on that, I think. Um, so the name I chose to give to this present state of fuzziness is the afterhood. And among my reasons for doing so is my desire to draw attention to the present presence, strange and sometimes confusing character as a translucent period that is largely defined in terms of its posteriority. Our present present follows that which we're used to thinking of as more concrete, more absolute, and more certain. So in the interest of um, uh, uh, diagramming, <laughs> After faith in faith, and after faith in knowledge, and after the crisis of faith and knowledge, there is simply faith, simply knowledge, and sometimes a nebulous sense of coming after. Um, to bastardize a line from, from Lyotard, um, he talks about philosophy, but I just switched it out. Um, after architecture comes architecture, but it is altered by the after. Um, at this point, I think it's important to, to note, or even to admit, um, that the afterhood, I'm not making any claim for the afterhood to be a sort of universal condition. Um, rather, I, I prefer it to be considered a particular and perhaps even local state of mind, um, a state whose presence uh, is indicated by an open-handed receptiveness to the present present. Um, indeed, it may well be that the afterhood, if it's useful at all, is peculiarly an LA state of mind. We'll, we'll see how it sort of plays out in the colder climes of Syracuse, New York. Um, this city is the nearest thing the new world has to an ultima thule, all of its own. And because this city also has penguins, dodgers, Washington robusta, it's clear to me at least that the characters of this new Elysium may be what permits us to refer to ourselves as citizens of the Holocene's propied capital of Afterness. Um, like LA, the present present, our afterhood, often gets a bum rap. Its very lateness makes the present present vulnerable to unfavorable comparisons with that which went before. Um, critics speak of the present, our afterhood, as dissolved, putrescent, dead. They convict it via its alleged murder, its codes of silence, and its absences. The present, we are told, constitutes a lack, an error. It's fragmented, splintered, and shallow. Abundance and variation are misconstrued as inadequacy and failure, and the battlefield of architectural discourse is left littered with the corpses of monsters, whilst the undead are alleged to haunt those of us that are left behind. It was against this background, uh, rather depressing background, or mor mor mortal background, um, and, in the, and in the light of a conversation uh, between Jeff Kipnis and Peter Eisenman that I think appeared in, in Log 28, um, in the summer of 2013, that Stefano and I decided to um, 
launch our Fellowship Cultural Studies elective that we taught earlier this year um, and call it Tendencies. Uh, our aim in this class was to ask students to develop cosmologies of the architectural present that went beyond a simple cataloging of multiple genres. In fact, I can see a couple of people who are in that class, so I'll defer to them as to whether any of this was achieved, but I'll set out the aims. Um, instead, we sought to have students identify trends, patterns, and tendencies in contemporary architectural practices that might then be worked upon to generate new positions and fresh readings of older work. We were looking for students to promulgate new and diverse lineages in pursuit of what Kipnis has called provocatively inter-architecturality. Inter um, my own interest in sort of mapping the present um, stems from a cultural studies class I took um, with Marceline Gao. I can't remember whether it was the first or second year of, of, of my master's program here at SIAR. Um, asked to write a paper uh, rather solipsistically called SciArc Now, um, and what we might now refer to as SciArc Then, um, I produced a couple of cosmological diagrams which sought to identify and locate the various positions then being advanced within the school, as well as the various types of knowledge, and I use that, that term advisedly, um, that seem to be contributing to the construction of those positions, whether they be broadly epistemological, ontological, or historical in character. Um, but strange things seem to happen to this latter category, which is to say the historical category. So these are the, these are the two diagrams that I produced. What, looking at them now, they're slightly hard to read at the scale, um, but it was an attempt by me to make sense of all the different crap that was being hurled at me during my time at SciArc. Um, as you guys know, um, who are in the midst of it, you can pass from studio to studio, and black can become white, and morning can become afternoon. Um, this was an attempt to try and make some sense of that seemingly sort of a disparate uh, collection of influences. Um, and alongside that, I did a diagram as to what, we, we can ignore, ignore the uh, imagery. Um, I produced a diagram which seemed to just try and categorize those types of things that as an architecture theorist, or perhaps even just an interested architect, we would need to have a working knowledge of. I mean, that's somewhat truisms, it seems to me, at this point, but it, it helped me to set it out in a diagram. That's to say a theory of knowledge, a theory of matter, which has been worked on it sort of excessively, perhaps, in the last few uh, months with the sort of exposure of the triple O program, and, of course, a theory of history, which uh, has also been engaging minds of late. Um, so as I said, strange things seem to happen in this latter category, the category of history in particular, in the present present. Um, such strange, strangenesses were highlighted in Dora and Bryony's recent uh, issue of Log, um, where the editors made the bold claim that we, or at least the New Ancients, are, and I'm going to quote you, Dora, if you don't mind. Uh, the foundation of architectural knowledge, from empirical experimentation, to revel in the archive and to revive narrative. They are, that is, the New Ancients, whether we include ourselves among those number, Tricksters and storytellers, drawing from a rich reserve of characters, folios, teasing out figures, qualities, shapes, and shadows, finally giving the verboten air to breathe. Now, there's much I, I wouldn't want to take issue with uh, uh, in that sentiment, not least because its author is, is, is sat in front of me. Um, but I do believe that on um, closer inspection, it's clear that the present present's relationship to what went before is far too problematic for us to imagine that plundering the archive is sufficient to generate new narratives. Or perhaps even more extremely, um, that indeed new narratives are what are required right now. It's my contention that we should rather understand the afterhood as irrepar irreparably separate from that which went before, and that it is via this strange dislocation, this breach, that our attention is drawn uh, to via the recent efforts of some, I'll, I'll say that again because I think I lost the, the, the meaning which I'm trying to uh, communicate. So it's via the breach, via the separation from our past um, uh, that we might begin to understand the work of recent architects who talk about their output in terms of a revi revival of architectural history. I want to argue that history does not resolve in the present and that the present present cannot and should not be resolved with a dose of history. Um, this is all sort of highfalutin stuff, so I had to go at some more diagrams. Um, 
And trying to diagram these thoughts has proven a little difficult, but I had a go. Um, one might imagine that the cosmos is a spherical tokamak. I think it's worth knowing what that shape is, if, if nothing else. Um, a spherical to to tokamak is a sort of a torus with the, the shape of an apple when it's cut through. Um, suspended in space, the core of the tokamak in this diagram, its external interior, provides a relatively secure spot for human teleologies to play out. According to this model, the present present, or the afterhood, occupies the space beyond. And we, its inhabitants, I would contest, are forever doomed to orbit our collective human history at some safe distance. On closer inspection, however, the tokamak turns out to be spongy. Its squidgy surface deforms under the weight of inquiry to produce, a strange, to produce strange chicane moments, where in history, that which went before appears suddenly impossibly close tight, comprehensible, and specific. The diagram I show here is just sort of one lineage, of a fairly sort of rudimentary lineage of what might be called a history of rough form or brutalism or even uh, rustication. But one might um, attach sort of any particular lineage in architecture to this kind of diagram. Um, the venture into this sort of territory is tricky and, and possibly silly. Um, who would seek to reduce or understand the polyvalent, polyvalent character of the present by way of an inadequate spatial metaphor? But my reasons for doing so are precisely to resist the easy characterization of the present present in more pedestrian terms. Um, it's undoubtedly the case that um, uh, uncertainty or the dizziness of freedom, as one uh, a famous Dane once called it, is disorientating. Um, I, when I, I, originally, I just Googled gravity poster to, 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 as a, a symbol of sort of disorientation, but then I found out that it's one of the most heavily gift, uh, more gifts. GIFs or GIFs? GIFs. GIFs. It goes either way. Goes either way. There you go. I'm sticking with GIF. Do I yeah. Um, so um, this is useful for me because uh, dis uh, disorientation induces nausea. Um, uh, it could also be said to induce boredom. Uh, writing in Log 29 last fall, um, Sylvia Lavin painted a plausible picture of a present present where there are no new states that rise to the structural order of either the critical or digital terms. Time, she concludes, is more or less at a flat line, and all that's left to us is the mopping up. There are, according to Sylvia, uh, no new states to argue for or against, or even less urgency. Now, it's in the architecture critic's nature to abhor a vacuum. Um, but I respectfully beg to differ. Familiar as we are with characterizations of interminable flatness, um, the most conservative reaction to the present present would be reaction, repudiation, and excision. The positing vaguely of some sort of return to the non-boring universalist uplands. For if the avant-garde is to understand itself of having any sort of agency, and if it doesn't, then what the hell is it for? Um, a will, if you will. It should also understand that it has collectively and perhaps unconsciously chosen not to avail itself of the older certainties that gave rise to the type of arguments that Sylvia and other, others seem to miss. In this way, the failure represented in the arguments of the group of morticians who seek to persuade us of our present lack can be understood as evidence of a very strange sort of success. We have succeeded in being, at being ourselves, in being the art, architects of failure, of not architecture. All this speculation matters in the present context, i.e. the context of this talk, because any useful characterization of the present present, the afterhood, I think turns on a collective understanding of the constitutive power of narrative in discourse, architectural or otherwise, to assert truths, provide meaning, and identify situations. I called this talk non-non-fictions because, because of the afterhood's resistance to narrative, to what I think philosopher Wilfred Sellers, he's dead, but if he weren't uh, <laughs> dead, he might call the fruits of the manifest image of ourselves as constructors of truths. Existing categories are problematic. Fiction is narrative, but it's also the case that non-fictions erect or seek to erect narrative schemes. Non-non-fictions, by contrast, are non-narrative, and they may even be anti-narratives. In his introduction to Trouble is My Business, um, which is a collection of four of his short stories, uh, American uh, novelist Raymond Chandler provides an insight on the formula of the detective story and how pulp magazines differed from previous detective stories. I'm just going to read a quote um, uh, that Chandler um, made. 
Um, the emotional basis of the standard detective story was and had always been that murder will out and justice will be done. Its technical basis was the relative insignificance of everything except the final denouement. Well, what, what led up to that was more or less passage work. The denouement would justify everything. The technical basis of the black mass type story, on the other hand, was that the scene outranked the plot in the sense that a good plot was one which made good scenes. The ideal mystery was one you could read if the end was missing. Chandler then appears not so much a weaver of narratives, but an author of non-non-fiction. We may even describe him as a, a successful novelist mank, uh, or monk, if we're going to be sort of vaguely French about it. Um, the idea of the architect monk, or failed architect, is mentioned by Colin Rowe in his short introduction to his first volume of collective essays, um, wherein he refers to a fractured spine that he received uh, during a parachute jump um, as a result of the Second World War. Unable to draft uh, architecture, which apparently involves sort of leaning over um, drawing boards at that point, it was a far more physical process than I suspect uh, we would recognize it as today. Um, he uh, accepted a junior fellowship at the Warburg Institute in, in London. Um, and it was in this context that, uh, by his own admission, he became an architect monk. I, I, I think it's sort of interesting to consider whether those of us who are in receipt of fellowships are already sort of on some track towards failure and doom. Um, uh, the idea of the um, architect monk for Rowe, however, um, I think was clearly an architect who fails to do architecture. I want to redefine the term for our present circumstances and to give it some sort of um, currency in the afterhood. Um, for me, an architect monk is an architect who does failed architecture, exquisite failed architecture. This revised version of the monk, at ease in the afterhood, emerges as a result of the failure of success and the success of failure. The monk is a, a mammal, expert in alchemistry and the transmutation of folderol and other ciphers. Predictably, the monk is also an opportunist, an animal capable of fashioning not lemonade from the bitterest crop of not lemons. But to fail so successfully, for this is the applicable standard, the architect monk must fail exquisitely and fail precisely. Judgment requires clarity, clarity of situation, and a situation always demands precision, even if such precision turns out, in the end, to be wholly imprecise. To be clear, the successful architect monk must be clear about what he or she is failing to achieve. Um, this is a kind of diagram that maps the topsy-turvy nature of the afterhood. The death of the hero produces the uh, uh, life of the monk. Um, on the horizontal axis in this diagram, I refer to, to comic and tragic. Um, I think it's important to state um, that my characterization of the architect monk um, needn't necessarily be humorous or lead to clownishness. One can be extraordinarily earnest about failure. Um, uh, and I, I think there's a danger that this sort of uh, approach that I'm trying to enunciate might be misconstrued as a sort of um, uh, a re revisitation of irony or of, um, or of funniness. And I don't, think, I don't think that's where I'm trying to go. That said, clowns do provide um, uh, us with a useful um, sort of tool to examine what, what the monk might be and how it might operate. Um, they act as a sort of precursor to the figure of the architect monk, if you will. Um, this diagram simply suggests that there are many sort of uh, responses to the contemporary condition, all of which are potentially monkish, but not every one of which relies on either the nudge or the wink or the, uh, the sort of cataclysmic misery um, of the failure. Um, I want to introduce you to George Carl, if you don't know him. Um, I think a review of his work, um, and he's a clown, or was a clown, is particularly useful. Carl was born in Ohio in, in 1916 and was a regular on American TV and now on YouTube um, during the latter half of the, the 20th century. Um, I'm going to try and play this out while I'm continuing to talk. Um, um, over the course of his career, Carl seemed to have perfected the successful performance of failure, the staging of negative experience. 
Indeed, his script uh, appears to have amounted to consistently testing how far it was possible to push the limits of an anti-performance and still qualify as a performer. That is, how one can be successful with an audience and secure long-term contracts to perform. Something sort of massively pragmatic about this definition of success, which I kind of like. Um, it's worth reading a little from theoretician uh, Paul Busiak's uh, close reading of one of Carl's performances. There's something wonderfully deadpan about it. Um, the extract relates to Carl's signature piece of business, which is the tangled wires, which he may be about to get to. Um, Carl noticed someone taking a photo, made a sign towards this person, winked, then knocked his hat against the microphone, which was standing in front of him. He took off his jacket, fixed the pleat of his trousers, put his jacket back on, his hat fell down. He caught it and tried to make a few ordinary tricks with his hat. He attempted to keep in balance with the edge standing on his forehead, but failed. He threw it so that it would land on the microphone. He bowed to the audience. He grasped the microphone stand and moved it a bit. His hands got entangled in the wire. The stand and the hat got tied up together by the wire. He managed to free his hands, but the stand fell apart, and one of his fingers now stuck in one of the stand's pieces. He got used to the microphone as a hammer um, to push his finger out, and put the other, but the, another finger got caught. The microphone was hanging. The wires were more entangled than ever. Leaning heavily on the work of philosopher H. Paul Grice, Busiak seeks to account for Carl's success, successful brand of failure by assuring us that none of the five principles established by Grice in his sort of assessment of what constitutes success, uh, or at least a successful performance, required, um, sorry, none of the criteria required by Grice for a successful performance are necessarily breached by failure. This is interesting to me because it effectively means that failure is not the opposite of success. It's a different sort of success. Of the five principles that Grice discusses, it's interesting to consider only the first three in the context of the present discussion. The other two relate to temporal issues, which I think um, it would be difficult to um, make useful in the context of the production of architecture. Grice's first principle concerns the accountability of the performer, i.e. the contractual nature of the relationship between performers and audience. Um, that is to say, you will be successful as long as the audience feels that you've somehow delivered. His second has to do with the semantics of the performance's content. In order to be relevant, it must, be, it must refer to cognitive categories, social structures, or cultural issues with which the audience is intimately familiar. So in the sense of uh, giving an architecture talk at SciArc, I've got to at least make some attempt to convince you that what I am interested in is architecture, even if only in the broadest sense. Thirdly, the principle of rhetoric applies to the articulation and patterning of the performance. The ordering of the successive plans toward a climax, or indeed anti-climax, the clarity of the demonstrations, of the competence concerned. In short, the audience must always perceive which plan is being implemented, or which plan is designed to create a particular expectation, even if those expectations, as in the case of Carl's performances, is eventually frustrated by the surprise implementation of an unexpected plan, which effectively supersedes the initial one. Well, here it seems we may have the beginnings of a theory of the architect Mark, a figure that enacts a certain skepticism in relation to those values and ideals traditionally associated with the discipline, precisely to enable those ideals and values to be reenacted behind a protective or veil of disinterest or strangeness. The monk as philosopher, Ray Brezia might have it, is a nihilist with a deep and abiding attachment to the truth. In this way, the monk's exquisite failures operate as a rescue, masquerading as an attack. By focusing on the problems of representation, language, and meaning, an architectural discourse is, in fact, sustained, even enabled. Indeed, in the oxymoronic world of the afterhood, I argue, failure constitutes architecture's most exquisite success, and progress is to be found not in some far-off distant land, but in the here and now. Um, for the remainder of the talk, how long have I been going on? Really? I'm going to take you very quickly through some of the work that might help, um, let's say, ground some of those points that I've just raised. Um, and I'll be as swift as possible. Um, it's useful to set up a little bit of context. I think uh, I went through the SciArc Masters program, the MR2 program, at a really fascinating time. Although having seen the reviews today, there's always a pang of jealousy once you've left that things move on and things get more interesting and more exciting. 
and that you're somehow left behind. That's a, um, certainly a response to being back here this week. Um, the particular moment that I was at SciArc um, uh, seemed to mark a certain point of transition between um, uninhibited, exuberant form and at least, a, on the face of things, a certain sort of challenge to the, the hegemonic position of, of that sort of uh, operation. So this is work from my 2GBX class, um, which you can see is, is, is taking exuberance to uh, an extreme degree uh, of interest. After that, I went through Hanan's studio. Um, and this is where I sort of began to uh, try and push um, the extremities of uh, complexity or even illegibility or opacity to, to, the, to the nth degree. I remember this project mainly for the fact that Rhino hated it and sort of refused to open on a, on a regular basis, which you can understand when you look at how screwed up the geometry is. But in a certain way, this project uh, operated as a sort of end point for me. Um, of, a, of an interest in, I don't know, in form, I guess, in, in the idea that we might push form um, beyond any sort of discernible category. Um, and you can see the plans are about as illegible as it gets. It's projects like this that, that give Sayak a bad name. Um, uh, after that, I went into David Rue's studio, and that was um, another exercise in um, extreme complexity. Um, starting with sort of dumb techniques like Rhino, uh, sorry, Photoshop as here, and producing um, via uh, the kind of softwares that bring the real world inside the computer, what can only be described as, uh, I don't know, some kind of refuse tip inhabited by, by uh, the 80s. Um, and then something else happened at SciArc during my time. Um, the new ancients, as they don't want to be called, um, but I will call them, um, in the form particularly of, of first Andrew Atwood and, and then Anna Niemark um, made their appearance, not only in school generally, but also as, as tutors of mine. Um, their agenda was different, and I'm particularly drawn to, to this project by them, um, and it's something that it would be um, silly not for, me, for, for me not to acknowledge, given um, where my thesis went. Um, which is to say here, um, the systems of, of logics that produce the architecture are, are binary. There is a thing and there is some sort of governing system, or let's say some sort of thing that is purporting to be a governing system, which moderates the stuff. So I think most of you know this project, but it's uh, essentially the taming of a mountain um, via a series of, uh, let's say, conventional uh, means of architectural representation. I think it's important to note that it's, it's subversion of those representational uh, tropes in pursuit of, of something strange. And if they don't like being called the New Ancients, they're certainly not going to like being referred to as architect monks. But um, I would like these guys to fall into that category, and I mean that as a, as a compliment. Um, I think the uh, challenge that they establish within their work between thing, anti-thing, and even a third category, which we might call text thing, um, is a potentially productive way to think about how the, the monk might negotiate um, contemporary practice. Um, there's a certain similarity then between that, those forms of representation and where I choose, chose to go with my, my thesis. Um, uh, not quite um, free from an attraction to, to complex or even ugly and stupid form, um, the thesis began with an ugly and stupid form. Um, where it differed from my previous investigations here at SIOC was an attempt not so much to discipline that form, but to translate it via a series of techniques that were known to me, diagrammable as such, but essentially opaque in character. Um, here you see the, the ugly and opaque form enmeshed in a translation um, of, its, uh, um, of itself. Now, I pushed the term translation to its... Uh, illogical conclusion here, a translation would normally suggest that there is some uh, legibility between the original and the thing that's been translated. Um, given the power of ZBrush's algorithms, that translation is sort of absolute at this point. And for me, it was particularly interesting that ZBrush, having no prior training in architecture in and of itself, um, was able to produce these strangely pedestrian architectural forms via a process which was uninvested in producing any such thing. Um, and here we can see the, I, I think the thesis review got bogged down with the whole Eisenman 
grid representational stuff. I should have steered clear of that. Um, uh, and the red, yeah, should have steered clear of the red. One, one learning these things in retrospect. Um, so I'm going to scoot through this stuff so we're running out of, uh, out of time. Um, what was produced, in, 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 particularly in the models, which uh, were un-3D printable for, for, for the reasons that the ZBrush produced this horrible geometry, was a, was a very strange sort of dissonant relationship between the original and the, uh, the translation um, to form a series of houses, at least notionally. Um, the fact that the original here now appears to be an interloper is sort of interesting uh, to me, and I think that was how it was sort of received. Um, I'm going to move quickly on to the teaching that I've been doing over the last year, um, in addition to the fellowship stuff. I taught a class at uh, Woodbury University, their design communication too, I think we would call it in science parlance, parlance visual studies, but it was actually a class for um, first and second year undergrads who had no experience of, of Rhino. So I called the, 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 the class Verblust with, again, an intention to engage with complexity, but to try and organize um, that engagement with some sort of uh, conceptual scheme. The scheme that I chose to borrow, of course, was uh, um, uh, Sira's verb list. Um, and it was incumbent upon the students as they learned Rhino, Photoshop, and Illustrator, which were the sort of uh, uh, prerequisites uh, you know, for the deliverables for the class, that they begin to understand um, and name um, the workflows that they were, were pursuing uh, in order to then be able to diagram them. I think these diagrams will remain a little bit opaque, but uh, that was the intention. A secondary sort of intention was to problematize the, the surface of the drawing by combining multiple layers together um, and multiple translations of, of known objects. This is a translation of uh, a pair of shears and a, uh, a video camera and Buzz Lightyear. Um, now, by combining the render with the, uh, the drawing in this way, there's a sort of strange 2.5D quality, which the students were then asked to translate um, into a, uh, an axo of a, of a composition. Um, uh, the gradients were really as a, 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 a consequence of having the students have to learn Photoshop. It seemed like a useful way to introduce that. Um, I think what was useful here about this process is how one might set up a, a known organizational strategy, but then conceive of that strategy in such a way that it is always seeking to sort of undermine its own ambitions. That is to say, it's knowable, repeatable, and discernible as such, but um, uh, it doesn't really aim at a, a deliverable <laughs> in the end. Um, there is no denouement to this process, only increasing complexity. Um, my current um, studio, uh, called Working Flat Out, um, it's been through about 15 names. This may be something that young faculty do. They obsess over the name of what they're doing rather than getting on and preparing the, the notes. This is something that I've experienced. Anyway, I stuck with Working Flat Out, um, which is a grad studio program at, at Syracuse. Um, I don't have a lot of their work. They're all hopefully furiously working away for our midterm on Tuesday, um, touch wood. Um, but the sort of warm-up project um, was, if you like, a slightly uh, more invested version of, of the work that I um, proposed at Woodbury. Each of the students in the studio was given, a, um, or rather chose, one of the last suppers. Um, we're fortunate in that um, European art history has afforded us with about 300 of these things from, from time immemorial, from about AD 300, when Jesus first makes an appearance in the art historical record, right up to the present day. Um, the task of this exercise was sort of twofold. One was to um, school the students in all of the weird and wonderful tricks that are being played um, in the construction, both of false perspectives or of strange axos um, or of uh, um, um, skewed drawings or sheared uh, projections, or even, as is the case with most of these drawings, sort of multiple different representational strategies being deployed all at once. Um, the other was to force them to consider if you like, the ineffable gap between what's represented and the problem that architects face of producing um, three-dimensional geometry. I'm going to try. This was not working. Ah, oh, there it is. So each student was asked to produce a three-dimensional object which was capable of producing in and of itself the, in this case, perspective um, of the Last Supper. 
But um, over and above that qualification that it should at a certain moment deliver on that image, um, essentially it was up to the student to produce um, uh, a geometry all of their own. Um, the freedom sort of inherent in this process is sometimes successful and, and, and sometimes gloriously um, a failure. Um, thesis prep is something that we also have at Syracuse. Um, and um, there I think um, I'm working with a couple of uh, undergrad students at the moment. They want to call their thesis uh, um, the obscure. I'm trying to convince them to call it the Liu Vague. So we'll find out how much um, uh, power the, the thesis advisor has. Hopefully now this has been recorded, um, they'll take note. Um, what's interesting to me about this project, and we're only a few weeks into to thesis prep, so these are just initial studies that um, Gamze and Nile have been um, undertaking is that that organizational grid which challenged, let's say, the form of the mountain in Anna and Andrew's project, um, or indeed the, the monstrous object at the heart of my thesis, has now morphed into a, um, a set of lines or governing frameworks which are uh, far more closely aligned to the object itself via a, a process of um, projection. Um, via the slight manipulation, therefore, of that grid, um, uh, or indeed the projected lines, the objects take on a stranger and stranger life. But um, I think there's something much subtler about this kind of work. And it, I mean, it begs the question as to where one picks the architecture at the end of all this. And this is something that the students are going to be struggling with, I think, with a, a, a recursive type project. Um, but I wanted to show it at the end, again, because it's, a, an, a, I think, potentially fruitful example of where, um, let's say, a type of approach to architecture which sets up more than one logic of production within a given project is potentially productive. Um, I rather like the fact that they're sort of macaroonish as well. Um, the final sort of um, translation here is again an exercise in extreme translation. Um, I'm trying to push the, the, the students at this point, given that it's thesis prep and not thesis, to engage in experimentation at all costs. Uh, to produce abundantly and query less often. Um, there will clearly be a point in this process where um, that will reach crisis point, um, not least because architecture schools still, and I think should demand some sort of denouement. Um, but resisting that temptation um, to uh, view the denouement uh, as both the means and ends is what I'm trying to advocate for today. Um, and at that point, I think we've reached a happy end. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, for um, this recapping. Um, I have a two-part question. Um, first, I want to express my surprise that SciArc didn't turn the title into a new nonfiction. Um, and uh, you understand why. Um, Second is, to what extent does preventing and does presenting a narrative about and resisting the qualities of narrative become counterproductive? Become a kind of monk? I mean, is this a performance? Is this a performance? Yes. It feels that way, but I think it's a different kind of performance. Um, is your question why this narrative? Well, no, my question is why present a, a, an argument about narrative as a narrative in which you're showing your own work and, you know, I mean, you're, you're basically saying, you know, here I did this happy failure and, you know, uh, once upon a time I tried, I failed the end. And, um, but the point of it is that it ultimately, you know, 
makes a reflexive kind of move against the idea of the narrative and the way in which that that controls, therefore, the definitions of anything that then spins from, from, from that narrative. So I'm asking you, is this a lecture or presentation or is it a performance? Well, I think it's a bit of both, but I, I don't want to run away with the idea that um, I, I think narrative needs to be employed um, in this context at this time to, to undermine its role in architectural production. It would be foolish of me, I think, to rule out narrative in all circumstances. Um, it's clearly something which facilitates discourse. Um, but there seems to me to be something about the present, if you like, critical dissatisfaction with the present, which ignores the potency of non-narrative. And, um, and it seems extraordinarily enamored, to my mind, of a, a extremely sort of antiquated view of um, uh, what architecture is about, what it might hope to achieve, um, uh, both for itself and for, for us as architects, but also uh, out in the world more broadly. Um, it's as though you scratch the, scratch the skin of most theorists and a sort of latent modernist uh, bleeds. Um, and I actually think the, the work that, that our generation and the contemporary architects can do is, is every bit as important and as potentially significant. Um, I mean, Sylvia used the term critical turn and uh, digital turn to sort of mark the present out in distinction to those two moments. Um, I'm in dangerous territory arguing with, with Sylvia, but um, uh, I, I'm not convinced of the, the characterization of the present as a, 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 as a lack, as an absence. Um, it may well be the case that those conditions need to be unpacked examined in their own terms. I think your question is slightly different, which is why not do a non-narrative lecture? Uh, why not take it on the head and do something a little weirder? Um, I, mean, we're, so I mean, also in the sense that the terms tend to be pretty Hegelian. Uh, what, you think I'm, I'm, I'm using an historical narrative to under, undermine that position? But, but that's why I say I think it's a performance and feel, I feel foolish asking a question about a performance. Well, it is a performance, but I, at the same time, it's me struggling to make sense of um, what's at stake today um, and convinced, actually, uh, that there are things at, at stake in, in the absence. All of the, the metaphors that talk of uh, emptiness or plain, plainarity of the historical landscape seem to me to be missing a trick. Now, it may well be that the best way to do that is not to um, capitulate to the very things that uh, one seeks to, to, to critique. Um, um, so if that's a criticism, I probably would accept it. I mean, I, uh, I think so, but I think it's also constructive in the sense that what I'm, I think what I'm really begging you is, begging from you is, um, you know, if, you've heard Freud's definition of humor, not jokes and the effects on their unconscious, but Freud's definition of humor. And Freud's definition of humor is highly contingent on the othering of the, of, of, of the, the non-subject, right? That the, the, the humor is received, that the humor is, is a kind of quotient that requires a, a subject and an other. And, um, and, so when you bring in, you know, the clown and the, you know, the, and you say, yeah, this is not irony, it, it leaves me wondering if you expect there to be an other in this. In other words, is, 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 there, is there a reader? Does architectural theory ultimately need a reader? And in some ways, there's a kind of hermetic quality to what you're doing. And um, I guess that's a question. Does architectural production, paper architecture or real architecture, need a, need a reader? I think I'm asking that if this is a narrative that you make, and if it's a performance, does it need an audience? Um, I'll take that question at face value. <laughs> um, I, I, think, I think this is a conversation amongst architects, right? right. I think that's true. Um, so to that extent, yes, it needs an audience, and um, it needs an audience that are familiar with what's gone before and with what's at stake right now. So it's a relatively parochial argument, and that's, that's one of the measures of success that um, the theoretician I mentioned um, 
uh, describes when measuring the success of a performance. A successful performance needs an audience that is willing to determine that. Okay, so let me extrapolate that. Does contemporary architecture require an audience? Hmm. Um, we, we have one, whether we, we like it or not. I think um, uh, when you say audience, are you implying an audience beyond the discipline? Both. Um, I'm very suspicious of uh, or nervous about, um, I'm nervous about anxieties about, <laughs> uh, about audience. That right. seems to me to be um, problematic because it presupposes that uh, uh, architecture has the ability or desire to tap into a, a discourse which seems very alien to architecture from my perspective. Um, it seems like a, a call for a return. And then Sylvia says this explicitly in that yes. piece. She's hankering after a moment, a sort of Berkeley moment, when there's this um, happy co conflagration of progressive politics and um, progressive architecture. And one seems for a moment to be in the service of the other and, and vice versa. Um, I, I don't find that a particularly desirable model right now. That doesn't seem to me to be the intellectual landscape that we are occupying. And so rather than negate negation, um, I'm interested in finding out what it can do for us. Um, I actually happen to think that um, you know, one critique of, of that sort of position might be that, well, where's the hell's the politics and all of this, or the ethics, or some sort of broader commitment to, uh, you know, beyond solipsism. Um, I actually think to it's essential that we sort of come to grips with stuff like this in order to create a, a contemporary politics, a politics of, or a, a, an ethics of disappointment, um, of failure. You don't think we're realism. at that moment yet? Sorry? You don't think we're at that moment right now? I think... Um, I mean, when the studios and when, the, when, when I hear a word like context coming back, you know, it seems to me that that's pushing on exactly that kind of breaking out of the hermetic... I'd be super nervous about context coming back. We don't, the last thing we need is all of the stuff that went before making an appearance. I mean, we've got to be careful of pendulum syndrome here. Just because there's a sort of uh, uh, feeling abroad that perhaps what we're doing is a little bit indulgent or decadent or sophisticated or for an elite audience. Um, if we simply sort of co-opt the, the old terms, contextual or political, we're not actually doing ourselves a, a service, which is to say um, what has been produced in the discourse in the last 30 years is, is interesting still. And um, there's a danger that we enter into a sort of dialogue of abandonment. Um, we've all felt slightly sheepish about what we do, <laughs> about its inability to sort of readily communicate itself to a broader world. Um, I think that's a fascinating project to work on, but I'd be very nervous about re repackaging or rebranding issues like context. It may well be that it's fascinating to rethink that term, but it would have to be a substantial rethinking of it. All too often, that term seems to be a sort of empty vessel that's just banded around in order to legitimize um, uh, it, the instrumentalizing of, of architecture, which, which, which I reject. Can I propose a different way of understanding politics? It seems like, um, and maybe it's because we're doing this in studio, it's all about politics, it seems like there are two very strong definitions, and Alejandro does a very good job in his last text uh, for the Biennale in Venice to describe a very different definition of politics in European culture and American culture, which I think for us being European, I think there is an incredible, powerful uh, distinction between the two. One the uh, European one being linked to real politics. There is a politician, there is a mayor, there are things yeah. that matter to the population and architects somehow enter the discussion and therefore matter to society because they adopt a view of doing good to the many. And then there is a much more contemporary idea of co-politics, which in a big way I think United States is and the autonomy idea of architecture pushed, which is much more about idea of globalization, uh, multi-oriented, uh, Idea, the fact that we're not anymore dealing with a single politics, a single uh, nation, a single race, a single culture. And architecture needs to reflect this multifaceted and quite ambiguous society. 
projects are now not dealing with context in the way they were dealing with context before, meaning being there and geographically next to something that is self similar, but actually context is much longer radius. Like you talk to buildings that are much further away from you, you have a radius of influence that is much different. Somehow I think the definition of politics changed, and I think Alejandro they did a great job actually linking politics to what architects do the best, which is, at the end of the day, formal definition, typological definition, and, and, uh, and mainly in the last text, uh, tectonic. It feels like we just need to adopt the word politics so that we are, again, somehow part of the discussion because those are the tools that architects can work with. Mm. I think if we keep on thinking about politics as something that was true uh, in modernism, um, then we become powerless or somehow we become people that do performances, which means that uh, it's utopian architecture. It's never, you know, it never goes beyond the academic world. You see, I, wouldn't, I don't think performance is the, is the bogeyman here. Um, it would seem to me to be self-evident that, that is what, that's what we're doing, that's where we're at, and that's the sort of truth of the nature of what we do, and that, that, that truth is, is valuable. For me, performance doesn't mask some sort of uh, hidden wiring that we, we should be concerning ourselves with. Um, there is no backstage to this performance that... that um, would delegitimize the performance or frame it as something less serious or less significant. I think that might be one of the problems with the, architect, uh, the arguments I'm trying to advance is that I'm using a lot of the furniture um, uh, from previous discussions, which, which has been sort of the, it's the, malign it's the malignant stuff, right? Failure, performance, um, uh, maybe even a, an equivocal attitude to the truth, um, uh, and certainly a, a, a problem with meaning as such. Um, none of these things for me are operative as a sort of front, front of stage um, set of activities. It, it seems to me that um, a healthy sort of dose of, of open-eyedness would, would mean that we would uh, refresh the discipline simply by seeing what we've been choosing to ignore. Uh, um, there's something of the hidden in plain sight about a lot of these categories. Um, I think you're right about the European-American distinction. I, the first year and a half here, it drove me nuts because the word politics is bandied around um, with sort of alacrity. Uh, and to Europeans, that tends to mean concrete issues such as sidewalks and um, tree planting and social security and healthcare and all of that stuff. And clearly, it has a much more rarefied um, sort of position within the academy. Um, but I don't think that this project undermines that position either. I think it just causes the search for a politics to embark on new journeys um, and potentially sort of uh, bring to light things about the things that we do that we've historically preferred to suppress. Are there, are there more questions? Um, so, despite any protestations to the contrary, you're succeeding beyond my wildest dreams. So, um, congratulations, and thank you, Ben. Thank you.